We've been transporting the LATAM 767-300ER fleet to Singapore and back for years. The aircraft were all delivered to LATAM new from Boeing over a decade ago and have been in service hauling passengers. These aircraft are slowly being replaced by a combination of A320s and 787 Dreamliners, and as the old 767s come out of service, they're being converted to full freighter aircraft for use in the LATAM cargo system. The vast majority of these aircraft have originated in and returned to Miami, LATAM Cargo's US hub, but this particular plane needed to be delivered from Santiago, Chile. A new route for me that took us over Antarctic airspace while en route to Auckland, New Zealand, our technical stop where we'd take rest and refuel the aircraft before proceeding to Singapore. The first leg over to Auckland took 12 and a half hours and we got delayed in Santiago before departing, so we ended up arriving four hours late into Auckland. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Four, two, Mike. We plan to arrive early enough into Auckland so that we'd have enough time to go into town and have a nice dinner and walk around a bit, but the delay in Santiago cost us too much time to do that. Still, we'd have enough time to eat something at the hotel and get a good night's sleep before departing again in the morning. As our cell phones came online, however, our hopes of a relaxing evening in Auckland got dashed yet again. Like I mentioned, Wes heads up Nomadics Asia operation, and one of his trips was operating at the same time as this one. An E-190 coming out of the Philippines bound for Roswell, New Mexico, where it will be parted out. The hundreds of messages that hit both of our phones at once was the first sign that something was up. We were still taxiing though, so we can only guess at that point that it was related to the E-190 delivery. That trip had some mechanical hiccups as it was leaving Manila, so we half expected to hear about issues once we got to New Zealand. This is fucking ridiculous, man. When you're overtired, it's funny. It's really not. I'm overtired. We've been waiting, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes to shut down. The stairs are literally moving at like one inch every, I don't know, in it. Once we finally got off the airplane, our suspicion was confirmed. While we were flying, the E-190 air returned to Majuro where the crew reset some things and then limped it to Honolulu, but then grounded it there in Hawaii with several major issues. Uh, but the bleed one fail remains, and um, yeah, we landed in Guam. And then once we landed in Guam, oh, not in Guam, landed in Majuro. <laughs> My bad. Um, came to full stop, pulled over, and um, the issue that we were having is on the descent back into Maduro, the flight deck was getting abnormally hot. We, you know, we were concerned that the bleed one leak was maybe causing further issues. You know, usually a leak is the beginning to a fire, right? So uh, instead of doing a, like a sort of a slow and steady approach back into Maduro, we elected to uh, come in next bit out of the two fire because the side that we're coming from. So just give you a situation awareness on that. Wes and I were both annoyed about having to deal with this in our current state of mind especially, but it could have been much worse. The crew did everything right and avoided the breakdown in Majuro, which would have been a complete disaster. Think Tom Hanks talking to a volleyball sort of situation. Anyway, um, so I came back and landed. There was uh, no British Airways on the runway, so we successfully landed on the runway. Yeah, and then taxied off. And then we sat there and looked at each other and said, what the fuck are we going to do? Because apparently we had no ECS system, which is our pressurization. And, uh, you know, the bleed issue had been starting all the way from Clark, right? Are you following? Basically, they took off out of Majuro and they couldn't pressurize and it was warm in the cabin, so they returned. 
Majuro, as you know from previous episodes, is a very remote location, a small atoll in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, about halfway between Hawaii and Indonesia. Getting parts and maintenance there would have been an all-out disaster. So anyway, we did uh, an electrical reset, which is something that sometimes helps the emperor. Shut the aircraft down five minutes completely, start it back on, and everything seemed to be functioning normally, so we decided to get gas, and did an engine run at the button, runway 07, everything looked normal, took off, everything was good. I don't really know much about the Embraer jet anyway, so most of what Issa was saying made little sense to me to begin with. Throw in the exhaustion from flying the last 12 hours after arriving on a red eye and forget about it. There wasn't a chance I could be of any help. One thing was for sure though, that E-Jet wasn't going anywhere. Lucky for me, this was Wes's customer anyway, and the look of defeat in his eyes said it all. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry that you had to sit through a full minute of that. Just be glad that you didn't have to sit through the full 20. Wes and I briefed the rest of the team in the U.S. who was already working on solutions, and within about an hour, we were able to sign off and let Bob, Chris, Mark, and Brianna deal with it. Auckland is one of my favorite cities. It's really awesome, and uh, we were really hoping to get here at 4 p.m., 3.45 when we were supposed to, but with the delays and everything, it's 9 p.m. and we just got here, and unfortunately, we have no time for anything other than hotel, restaurant, um, and then sleep, which we desperately need, but what a, what a place. <laughs> what, a, what an awesome city. Super cool. Well, goodbye, Auckland. I barely knew you. We're uh, getting out. It's 7.30 and I'm late for the van. It almost doesn't matter how long the rest period is on these long-haul flights. A few hours of REM sleep, a hot meal, and a shower breathe new life into me. I would have loved a few more hours of sleep, but with proper caffeination, I was good as new and ready for the next flight. What's up, Gardner? What's happening? This is like... Worst. First trip back after three years, you could possibly have. You talking about our trip, or are you talking about what's going on with all the rest of the trips? Well, because I'm pretty disappointed that you're making me get out of bed <laughs> after sleeping in that park high. That bed was the best <laughs> bed I've ever slept in in my life. <laughs> so I'm not happy with you this morning. <laughs> and then, so so unhappy that you skipped breakfast. Yes. Yeah, and that's saying a lot. <laughs> and then the 190. It's a mess, man. Yeah, and uh, you saw that my two <laughs> trips that Pat and David left for like four hours ago just delayed by five days. Oh, no. Yep, and they're in route. I think they're good to extend, but that's gonna cost the customer a lot of money, which I'm not happy about. And then um, we've got, uh, what else? The Loda issue, still no uh, resolution on that. My A340 guy times out on Sunday, so we can't use him. Now we have to recrew that. And we have, uh, what else? There's another one. Oh, the uh, air, the 700 in Morocco coming to the U.S. That still no SFP, still can't launch through. It's been a fucking nightmare. What's going on? Like, what's in the water, man? Like, what's <laughs> like? I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. Our band's here. Oh, right, let's get on it. And off we went to the airport. 
On the schedule today, a 10 and a half hour flight across the ditch, across Australia, and up over the Timor Sea into Paya Labar, an auxiliary airport in Singapore. We arrived at the aircraft and did our thing. It was a chilly, overcast day. Wes would fly this leg in the left seat and I'd run the radios from the right seat. Wes programmed the box and I did the walk around. Like I always say, flying planes is the easy part of this job, the fun part. Managing the trips when I'm back home at the office stateside is much harder, especially when things go off the rails. Things were very much awry on this particular day, so I'd be lying if I didn't mention the sense of relief I felt knowing that I'd be out of contact for the next 10 plus hours. Nomadic 2, 9 or 0, contact approach 1, 2, 4, decimal 3, airborne, wind 0, 2, 0, 10, 0, 5, right, clear for takeoff, good day. Auckland to Singapore was a 10 hour and 45 minute flight, only really about an hour and a half shorter than the Santiago to Auckland leg. Once we climbed out above the rainy overcast layer, we found clear blue skies that lasted pretty much all the way to Singapore. Nomadic 290, Auckland Radio, good morning, Dave. Good morning, Nomadic 290, Alice next. Nomadic 290, Roger. Auckland Scan, primary 8867, secondary 13261. At Rigby, contact Brisbane Centre 124, decimal 9 of 5. Secondary Brisbane Radio 13261, shall call check. About an hour into the flight, not quite actually, uh, out of out of Auckland, we're now across crossing the ditch, as they call it, between uh, between New Zealand and Australia, and we're level up at 36,000. It was kind of a mad rush to get out this morning. Um, we had essentially a, a, a tight arrival time into uh, into Pile of Bar. It's a military base, and they have very strict restrictions on on when we can arrive and depart. Um, 
and so we had like a 45 minute window to make and the way this trip has been going everything is just you know it seems like everything's constantly going wrong for us so i wanted to get there early get everything but we got to the airplane this morning we were fueled up everything was ready to go and we got out right on time i think we departed one minute early or something so pretty nice day out out there We'd only be on HF briefly while crossing the ditch, a 1,200 nautical mile stretch of ocean before coasting in over Brisbane where we'd reestablish VHF two-way radio communications and radar contact with Brisbane Center. Been, uh, we've been flying a while now. Um, what are we, two, three hours in? Four? Five and a half. Five and a half? Wow, it's going fast. So we're about halfway there. We're over the middle of Australia. We'll, uh, we'll go check out the airplane. The 7.6 is small, kind of hard to maneuver here when I mean, you're not looking. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Definitely uh, try to move around, walk around. It just, you know, not only is it mind numbing to sit there in the seat, you know, the entire time for hours and hours and hours on end. You can only eat so many times. You can only talk about so many things. So, so we're we have a there's a landing restriction that popped up yesterday that says we have to be in by before 07Z and we're scheduled in at 0710 and that's a problem. So our dispatch is now telling us we either have to get there before seven, which we can't, we're already doing eight three, or we'll likely get diverted to Shanghai. And if we end up down there, and we're gonna have to sit on the ground for a couple hours and then, and then head over after 9Z when the restriction ends. We have a lot of gas. So we're trying to get, um, trying to figure out if we have the endurance to hold till 9Z. But the problem is we may not get the order to divert until we're down low. So, and then we're not gonna have the endurance to hold for essentially an hour and 40 minutes. The message about the possible divert came across on a free text message over ACARS from Mark, Nomadic's lead dispatcher. We typically only have ACARS capabilities on LATAM aircraft since they're actively on the LATAM AOC and not transitioning between operators like most of our flights. In normal operations, we communicate with dispatch through handheld Garmin in-reach devices, which utilize the Iridium satellite constellation. They work pretty well and they keep us in touch with the ground at all times. Anyway, we were now north of the Timor Sea and overflying some Indonesian islands. We really needed to have a plan together within the next two hours. A diversion to Singapore and later repo over to Paya Labar was not an ideal situation. We'd miss our flights out and incur significant unplanned handling charges. We sent a final ACARS message to Nomadic Ops and said if we couldn't land at Paya Labar at 10 past, we wanted to remain above 25,000 feet in holding until which time we could get in. We waited patiently for an answer, but never received one. At about 100 miles out, we got instructions to descend via the arrival into Paella Bar, so we figured we were either going to get diverted to Singapore, or they were just going to let us in. The frequency was busy, and I didn't want to tie up the channel with a bunch of questions, so we just went with the flow.
We lucked out. We actually never heard a peep about it, and we were cleared to land without as much as a single turn in holding. Hey man, any parting words now that we've completed the journey? And yeah, we, got the, we got it done finally. We did, it was a long one. 11,240 nautical miles straight line. I don't know, probably longer since we went. Yeah, some Great firsts stuff. for me out there. Yeah, CIA, so. first time ever flying an airplane. Yeah. <laughs> in three years? Yeah, in three years. I greased it. Pepper simulators, of course. Yeah. Um, you did grease it. Yeah, well, until next time. As usual, I hit the ground running for my flight out without so much as a nap and a shower. My ride home was on JAL to New York via Tokyo Haneda. I was unconscious before we even pushed back from the gate in Singapore, and I remember waking up to recline my seat into a bed when we were airborne, likely an hour or more after takeoff. Said and done, this was a five-day trip door-to-door, -door, and despite the usual obstacles and delays, we completed the mission successfully, getting the aircraft into its conversion slot exactly on time. The E-190 ended up stuck in Honolulu for two more weeks before the parts would arrive and be installed. That headache continued for Wes and myself and the Nomadic team, but ultimately got resolved and our client was happy, and that's really all that matters to us. Thank you.